Hello, everyone. Thank you for taking your time to join us today for this exciting webinar being brought to you by Syntica. My name is Gabriel Escalante, and I will be your host for today's webinar. Our webinar today is entitled Applications Review, Highlighting Imaging Examples Using the IVM Intravital Microscope. Today's webinar, today, today we will have two presenters, Dr. Pilham Kim, Associate Professor at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and CEO of IVM Technology, Dr. Kihon Jung, Assistant Professor at Seoul National University College of Medicine, and Tanya Coltard, Product Manager within the Imaging Division at Syntica, which will be helping us during the live Q&A section. Allow me to provide some background information out about our guest speakers. Dr. Kihon Jung received his bachelor's and PhD degree in biological sciences at Korea's Advanced Institute of Science and Technology in 2005 and 2010, respectively. From 2010 to 2018, he worked as a research fellow at Harvard Medical School. In 2018, he joined the Seoul National University College of Medicine as assistant professor at the Department of Anatomy and Cell Biology. His lab's research focuses on the immune microenvironment in tumors with the aim to provide novel avenues of immunotherapy of cancer by means of identifying promising targets in tumor immunity utilizing advanced methodologies, including in vivo imaging and single cell genomics. Dr. Pilham Kim received his bachelor's and PhD degree in electrical engineering from Seoul National U University in 2000 and 2005, respectively. From 2005 to 2010, he worked as a postdoctoral research fellow at Harvard Medical School with a cross-disciplinary postdoctoral fellowship from the Human Frontier Science Program. In 2010, he joined Korea's Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, where he currently is a tenured associate professor at the Graduate School of Nanoscience and Technology. His main research focused on systemic cellular level visualization of various preclinical model organisms to investigate complex pathophysiology of human disease leading to the development of an advanced in vivo cellular imaging technology based on an ultra-fast laser scanning intravital microscopy system. During this webinar, we'll provide you with real-world examples of IVM applications in collaboration with our reference sites. We will present specific examples of how to apply the IVM system to address various research questions. After this webinar, you'll have an understanding of how the IVM system can be applied in preclinical research to visualize and analyze in vivo dynamic processes at cellular level. As some of you may know, Syntec is a distributor of IVM's intravital microscopy platform systems in North America. Today's webinar is the third in a four-part series. And please keep an eye out for emails in the coming week with additional information about the uh, final upcoming webinar or visit our website to watch our previous session. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly mention a few housekeeping rules. We'll anticipate that today's presentation will be 45 minutes so we'll have time to answer your questions live. Please feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A dialog box throughout the presentation. And additionally, we'll create a transcript of the questions. We'll distribute this document within the next week or so. Please also note that we're recording today's session. So if for some reason you lose connection or cannot hear everything clearly, you will have access to that video file to review later. Without further ado, I'm going to pass things over to Dr. Jung. Hello, my name is Ki Hun Jung. I'm from Seoul National University. So today I'll talk about the real-time intraviral analysis of the immune microenvironment in cancers. So with a bit of focus on a particular subset of the monocyte, which is called non-classical monocyte or LICC low monocyte in the setting of anti-angiogenic cancer therapy. So for brief background information, as you see here, there are various types of cancer therapies available in the clinic. So previously, there were more attempts to develop therapies to kill cancer cells directly, such as chemo or radiation therapy or the so-called targeted therapy. However, these days, there are more and more drugs being developed to target the tumor microenvironment, such as immunotherapy or anti-angiogenic therapy and many others like this. So given the success of these drugs, it is quite obvious that the targeting the microenvironment is very effective in treating cancers. Let me show you a quick and simple example of the importance of the microenvironment here. 
So these are the mice with same 4T1 uh, cancer cells growing at different locations. And 4T1 is a triple negative breast cancer. So even with the same cancer cells growing in their bodies, the biology inside the tumors are quite different because the tumor microenvironments are not the same depending on the location of the bodies. Actually, although many people are still using ectopic tumor models utilizing dorsal skin chambers or subcutaneous back flank implantation, it is well known that studying with ectopic tumor models often cause confusion in the field, and it is hard to be eventually translated into the clinic. So it is very critical to study tumors growing at their orthotopic size to obtain scientifically reliable and clinically relevant results. So while I've been extensively working on many different aspects of these components of the microenvironment, given that the anti-angiogenic therapy is a standard of care for multiple types of cancers, today I'll share some of the results with targeting angiogenesis. So the angiogenesis, which is new blood vessel formation by the sprouting of the pre-existing vessel, is one of the hallmarks of cancers. And among many angiogenic factors, the VEGF signaling pathway is a key component of pathological angiogenesis in most cancers. Supporting these facts so far, 10 different anti-VEGF drugs have been approved by the FDA to treat various solid tumors in the clinic. <coughs> Excuse me, in the clinic, starting with metastatic colorectal cancer back in 2004 as the first indication. <coughs> However, the survival benefit from this drug is quite disappointing in practice because tumors develop resistance to these drugs. So there have been a couple of potential mechanisms of the resistance proposal so far. Among these, given the recent huge success of cancer immunotherapy in the field of oncology and that it is literally the era of cancer immunology, emerging data show that the immune system also plays a critical role in the resistance to anti-angiogenic therapy. So today, I'm going to focus on the role of the immune cells in the resistance process. So these are the typical immune microenvironment in cancer, which is characterized by abundant infiltration of various lymphoid and myeloid immune cells. And also, as tumors grow, some of the immunosuppressive cells are expanding such as FOXP3 positive regulatory T cells and MDSCs and even some of the M2 polarized the tumor associated macrophages. And these immunosuppressive cells are the major players for the immune escape of the tumors because these cells suppress the anti-tumor immunity and help tumors avoid the host anti-tumor attack. Also, there have been several reports showing that these immunosuppressive MDSCs also contribute to the anti-angiogenic therapy resistance process. However, would it be really true? So the MDHC is defined as CDLMB positive and GR1 positive cells in mice, and depending on the expression level of surface marker GR1, it can be divided into the two different subsets. One is monocytic MDHC, and the other is granulocytic or polymorphonuclear MDHC. However, the problem is, they actually, the GR1 is not a single surface marker at all, but it's actually a complex of two different cell surface marker proteins, Li6C and Li6G. Therefore, even though people divided uh, in MDSCs into two different subsets, the MDSCs are actually very heterogeneous, and it's a mixture of so many different subsets of the immune cells, including monocyte and neutrophils and their immature precursors and some of the M2 polarized tumor associated macrophages and many other cell types. So in practice, when you say MDSCs, we never know what exact cell types contribute to tumor growth. This is why we have to study the process with immunophenotypically pure and clearly defined subpopulations using very specific surface markers such as Li6C and Li6G in order to correct the entire research field on immunosuppressive cells in cancers. But not just with GR1, not just as a bulk population MDSCs, which include so many different cell types in it. Also, another big problem, maybe even bigger problem in the field is that 
since immune cell migration and their interactions are too highly dynamic, especially when it comes to in vivo. So the immune microenvironment is actually pretty difficult to study using conventional experimental techniques that only allows very static analysis at certain time points. So we needed new methods to monitor such dynamic behaviors of immune cells in vivo and real time. And this is one example we developed, which is named side view colonoscopy, that we can insert this thin imaging probe made of green lens connected to our custom built multi photon microscope. So, using this method, we can visualize the entire structure of the colon from the lumen side. This is a typical hexagonal blood vasculature of the normal colon at a physiological condition, visualized by trichidextran IV the intravenous injection. And this imaging system has a special, uh, special resolution of a 1 micron and actual resolution of a 5 micron, which is high enough to visualize objects at single cell level. And this is a real picture of the imaging setup of the intravenous microscope that we used. So we also equipped our custom built multi photon microscope scanning part with fast rotating polygonometer and galvanometer. We can achieve a video rate acquisition which is faster than 30 frames per second. So just for your, for your information, so the other people's conventional intravital microscope, microscope that you guys might have heard about so far has much slower acquisition rate than video rate, which is like five frames per second or even slower than that. In fact, this fast acquisition rate is quite important to study biological um, event because, for example, this is a monocyte rolling along the vessel wall which is patrolling the endothelium and some of the flowing cells inside the vessel. So all of these are being played in real time. And as you see here, you can even visualize flowing cells inside the vessel and even quantify them together with other parameters such as rolling and crawling behaviors of leukocytes and of course, other people's conventional intravital microscope with a slower acquisition rate cannot visualize these dynamics. So to compare with other method, when we use conventional histology, this is the only result we can get from a single mouse because we have to sacrifice the mouse after the experiment. But when we use intravital microscopy, but still other people's conventional in vivo imaging, of course we can get some more information, but still very limited and only partial steps of the entire process. So we cannot really know what's going on in detail where this where the cell is moving to or just staying at one spot. But if we use our imaging system with fast video rate scanning, we can simply visualize the whole process of cell migration very easily in real time. Therefore, I would say our imaging system is the only method suitable for immune cell trafficking in vivo. And having these techniques available, we studied the role of the immune microenvironment in anti-VEGF therapy resistance process. So first, to obtain clinical insight, we looked for potential immunomodulatory factors responsible for the res resistance. So we analyzed rectal cancer patient samples before and after bevacizumab treatment. Bevacizumab is a monoclonal antibody against VEGF, and its commercial name is Avastim, developed by Jianpei. So among many factors, um, we found a huge increase in expression of chemokine ligand CXL12, which is also known as uh, Stefan Alpha, and its receptor CXL4 chemokine receptor after antiangiogenic treatment. So consistent with this clinical data from rectal cancer patient samples, in our preclinical pre models, we also found a significant increase in both CXL4 and CXL12 expression after DC101 treatment. DC101 is a murinized form of ramasuramab, which is a monoclonal antibody against VEGF R2, which we used as an anti-angiogenic agent in mice models. So this result is from a spontaneous rectal tumor model using APC conditional knockout mice, and we observed the similar results in two different orthotopic colon cancer models. One is SR4 tumor, and the other is CT26 as well. But these findings indicate that our CRC, CRC model, colorectal cancer models, recapitulate the response of primary human colon cancers of patients treated with bevacizumab. 
So the next question was, then what is the role of the unregulated CXR4? So given that CXR4 is important for cell survival signaling, we tested whether the arm regulation of CXR4 is directly involved in cancer cell proliferation per se. However, as you see here, these MTTSA results show that this is not the case. So then, what is the role of CXR4 in the tumor microenvironment? Given the important role of the CXR4 as a chemo chemical receptor in chemotaxis of a leukocyte, we analyzed various immune cell populations in the colon cancer microenvironment and found that CXR4 is mainly expressed by the monocytes and neutrophil. So we further investigated these innate immune cells. So in this facts plot, this lysis G positive population is neutrophil, and this lysis G negative and lysis C high population is the classical monocyte, or some people call this as the inflammatory monocyte, or even a phenotypically lysis C low monocyte, I'm uh, sorry, lysis C high monocyte. So in addition to these two populations, we also identified this novel population, lysis G negative and lysis C low population, which we call non-classical monocyte or lysis C low monocyte. So while there have been many reports on these neutrophils and classical monocyte, there is almost nothing known about the non-classical monocyte in the field of oncology, especially in the setting of anti-VEGF cancer therapy. But I'll show you soon though that we found a very interesting and previously unknown function of these monocytes in cancers for the first time. So we analyzed these uh, populations during the course of anti-VEGF therapy. So the first row is the non-classical monocyte, and the second row is the classical monocyte, and the third is the neutrophil. C is control, and DC101 is the anti-VEGF factor antibody. So first, five days after DC101 treatment, there was a selective increase in tumor infiltration of the non-classical monocyte compared to the control. And on day 12, we observed a further increase in non-classical monocyte. And we also observed a similar kinetic response in CT26 tumor, which is another orthotopic tumor model we use. So these results so far show that the non-classical monocyte respond to anti-VEGF therapy first, and then they infiltrate into the tumor tissues. So for short break number one, we found that anti-angiogenic therapy increased expression of chemokine receptor CXR4 and its ligand CXL12. However, this chemokine receptor is not involved in cancer cell proliferation per se. Instead, it is expressed by the monocyte and neutrophils. And among these cells, anti-VEGF R2 therapy facilitates the early infiltration of the non-classical monocyte. So next, we wanted to investigate the dynamic tumor infiltration of non-classical monocytes. So to do so, uh, we develop uh, the, to investigate the dynamic uh, tumor infiltration of the monocyte, we utilized the multi-photon microscopy. So to do so, we developed a novel abdominal imaging window for this study. So through this window, we can longitudinally monitor the tumor growth for a long time and visualize the tumor microenvironment in vivo at any time we want. So we can visualize the green color labeled monocyte inside the post capillary venule in the normal cecum and in the tumor as well. And this is a video being played in real time, of course. So in addition to this um, crawling and rolling monocyte inside the vasculature, we were also able to monitor fast moving flowing cells in the bloodstream thanks to the video red scanning system, which is fast enough to capture such dynamic migration. So in animals treated with DC-101, we frequently observe these green monocytes freely flowing in the blood that then began to interact with the vessel wall, either rolling or crawling, and some of the crawling cells subsequently extravasate out of the blood vessels. So basically, we can vi we visualize the entire process of serial uh, transmigration of the monocytes. And like this, using this method, we can visualize and quantify different behaviors of immune cells in the vessel. So the extravasation is a series of events that these originally flowing cells start interacting with endothelium, trying to find a spot to go out, which is rolling, and, event, and eventually uh, they are stick to the vessel wall at a certain spot and crawl. 
and then transmigrate across the endothelium. And we found that this one on one treatment significant, significantly increased the number of the rolling and crawling non-classical monocyte, which results in massive infiltration of these cells, which is also shown by a flow cytometry, as I showed some minutes ago. So also from the gene expression profile analysis of each subset, this non-classical monocyte expressed high amount of another chemokine kind of receptor, which is called CX3CR1. So next question was whether this chemokine kind of receptor, CX3CR1, is critical for the monocyte transmigration across the endothelium or not. So we addressed this question using the in vivo imaging technique to provide direct evidence by the real-time visualization. So to make a long story short, measured by intravital microscopy, there was a significant decrease in the number of crawling and non-classical monocytes isolated from cx one knockout mice compared to that from the wild-time mice. But these observations suggest that chemokine receptor cx one plays an important role in chemotaxis driven transmigration of the monocyte especially in the process of a rolling and crawling transition of this non-classical monocyte. So then the next question was, so what is the upstream event? So which factors contribute to the chemokine receptor dependent tumor infiltration of these non-classical monocytes? So the CX3C L1, which is also known as fretakine, is the only known ligand for CX3C R1 chemokine receptor. So basically, the R is a receptor and L is a ligand. So we analyzed the fretakine expression from biopsy samples of rectal cancer patients before and after the vasitumab treatment and found a dramatic increase in fretakine expression after the treatment. But this actually makes sense because apparently anti vegf therapy somehow upregulates fretakine and this ligand attracts its receptor cx one which is expressed by the non-classical monocyte. So then the next question was, what types of cells in the tumor microenvironment produce fretakine and how they regulate their expression? Among many cell types, we found that CD31 positive endothelial cell produce the cx one and the expression level is regulated by VEGF, VEGFR2 signaling directly meaning that when you block the VEGFR2 signaling in endothelial cell by DC101, there was a dramatic increase in cx one chemokine chem chem ligand expression. So these results suggest that the cx one chemokine ligand is produced by endothelial cells, and the blockade of VEGFR2 signaling in endothelial cell stimulates robust upregulation of this chemokine ligand which subsequently caused active recruitment of the receptor cx one positive non-classical monocyte tumor, uh, tumor tissues. So for break number two, the non-classical monocyte expressed another chemokine receptor cx r one on their surface, and this chemokine receptor is very critical for the tumor infiltration of this non-classical monocyte, especially in the process of the rolling and crawling transition of these non-classical monocytes and the blockade of VEGFR2 signaling in endothelial cell unregulates the ligand, chemokine ligand, fretakine, cx 3 l one So next, we determine the in vivo function of each cell subset on tumor growth by specifically inhibiting their infiltration to tumors. For example, using cx 3 l one knockout mice, we can deplete non-classical monocyte in tumors. Similarly, we can deplete classical monocyte and pharmacologically block neutrophil infiltration. So in cx one knockout mice, in DC101 monotherapy, blue line here, solid line here, exerted an enhanced anti-tumor effect compared to the same treatment in wild-time mice, the black solid line here. So we conclude that the hindrance of DC101 induced early infiltration of non-classical monocyte is sufficient to improve the anti-tumor efficacy of anti-VEGFR2 therapy. And next to see if we can rescue the knockout mice phenotype in cx 3 one knockout mice, so we carried out a series of adaptive transfer experiments with wild type and mutant non-classical monocyte. And indeed, tumor weight of DC101 treated on cx 3 one knockout mice that received adaptive transfer of wild type non-classical monocyte was significantly higher than that of DC101 treated cx 3 one knockout mice without cell transfer. 
these gray and blue bars here. So these data suggest that TXRCR1 signaling is the key mechanism driving non-classical monocyte tumor infiltration and that non-classical monocyte influence tumor growth, meaning that somehow these monocytes promote tumor growth, right? Then how? Then how do these monocytes promote tumor growth? We first tested whether the monocyte might have angiogenic function and actually we believe so since we initiated the study to find the anti vegf therapy resistance mechanism. So it was likely that tumor infiltrating monocytes are angiogenic. But as you see here, that was not the case at all, which was quite frustrating, frustrating, data, frustrating data back then. But looking back, thanks to this result, we thought of the totally new aspect and discovered a novel function of this monocyte which is not really related with angiogenesis at all, that was immunomodulation. So instead of angiogenic function, we found a previously unknown function of these monocyte, immunosuppression. Now we found that they express high amount of immunosuppressive cytokine such as IL-10, and we also observed that lymphocytes in DC-101 treated tumors express less coenzyme B and more immune checkpoint molecule such as PD-1 showing an exhausted and dysfunctional phenotype which was reversed in CX-1 knockout mice. So these data suggest that DC-101 treated tumors became skewed toward an immunosuppressive phenotype by the infiltration of this non-classical monocyte. And we also performed in vitro CFSA assay by co-culture of the monocyte and T lymphocyte and revealed that these non-classical monocytes inhibit effector T cell activity. Also, we found that the treatment with an anti-IL-10 neutralizing antibody prevented non-classical monocyte from inhibiting T cell proliferation. Thus, we conclude that the DC101 induced recruitment of non-classical monocyte producing IL-10 inhibit effector T cell activation, leading to a shift of the tumor microenvironment toward immunosuppressive, so toward immunosuppression and thus to an attenuated immune response against the tumors. So for brain number three, this non-classical monocyte attract neutrophil, although I couldn't show you today due to the time constraint through a, another chemical receptor pathway, and block it of non-classical monocyte infiltration by using genetic model if it significantly improves the efficacy of anti-VEGF therapy and adoptive transfer of a non-classical monocyte rescue the knockout mice phenotype and these monocytes produce immunosuppressive cytokine including IL-10 that drive immunosuppression in the tumor in the microenvironment. So due to the time constraint, let me skip this part and then back to go to the you know, my final conclusion slide. So to summarize what I talked about today, so when you start anti-angiogenic therapy, the blockade of VEGF signaling pathway in endothelial cell upregulate phratokine ligand CX3CL1 that attract the CX3CR1, the receptor positive non-classical monocyte into the tumor tissue. And those tumor infiltrating non-classical monocyte um, recruit this neutrophil to tumor as well. <clears throat> And these cells, these innate immune cells, secrete high amounts of immunosuppressive cytokine, including IL-10, to induce immunosuppressive microenvironment by inhibiting cytotoxic T cell activity, which results in promoting tumor growth. <coughs> and you propose and confirm several therapeutic strategies to block each step of these cascades. For example, cx r one knockout for a genetic model to inhibit non-classical monocyte infiltration. And we also develop a nanoparticulated siRNA delivery to tumor endothelial cell to downregulate cx r one chemokine ligand. And we also show that anti-lysis G tr treatment efficiently blocked the neutrophil infiltration. And with all of this, we observed a dramatic improvement in anti-tumor activity of anti-VEGF therapy. And the um, majority of the work that I talked about today was done during my postdoc career in, Dr. in the Steel Lab. So I'd like to acknowledge all the people in the Steel Lab, especially my mentor, Dr. Rakesh Jain, and Tai Fukumura, and Tim Padera. And the nanoparticle work was a collaboration with uh, Bob Langer and M Dan Anderson Group at MIT. And since now I'm back in Korea, these are my um, wonderful ongoing collaborators. And Charles, um, 
motivated and helping us, having motivated and helping us on single cell RNA sequencing to reveal the heterogeneity of the tumor immune cell, especially the myeloid cell populations. And these are my old surgeon collaborator who generously uh, provide the um, patient, fresh patient spe tumor specimens. Uh, thanks to all my, colla my collaborator and thanks to my old my lab member as well. And, and this is it. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Jung. I will now hand over the presentation to Dr. Kim. Hello, uh, my name is Pian Kim. So today I'd like to introduce real-time intravital imaging of pulmonary microcirculation and immune response in sepsis animal model. To begin, Compared to conventional imaging technology, which only provide tissue level information, the intravital microscopy can directly observe dynamic cellular movement in internal organ of live animal model for human disease. This example video shows how this lead neutrophil inside a vessel forms a cluster and blocks the green blood circulation in the lung of a sepsis animal model. So today, I'll explain more about this example study. To conclude, intravital microscopy can provide a very detailed live video of the disease development in cellular level. Compared to the macroscopic scale imaging, such as X-ray, ultrasound, PET, CT, MRI, or OCT, which only can provide organ and tissue level structural information, the microscopic scale imaging and analysis can be possible by using the intravital microscopy. Intravital microscopy can enable a dynamic 3D imaging of various cellular level dynamics, such as cell trafficking, cell cell interaction, and cell microenvironment interaction inside the living preclinical animal model in vivo. For the drug development, the intravital microscopy can enable a direct image analysis of, uh, for the uh, monitoring of the drug delivery to the target tissue and cell, assessing the drug efficacy and validating the mode of action in various preclinical animal model of human disease. Indeed, the IBIM's intravital microscope has succeeded in high quality live cell imaging of almost all of the internal organ in a live animal model, as you can see in this slide. It includes brain, brain tumor, skin, lung, spleen, dry tract, prostate, lymph node, memory tissue, placenta, kidney, liver, muscle, heart, and retina. IBM technology provides all in one intravital confocal and two photon microscopy system. In addition, IBIM also provides one-stop research service of intravital imaging for the researchers in academia and industry. One of the unique features of IBIM's intravital microscopy system is it is equipped with the ultra-fast laser scanner, which enables ultra-high-speed in vivo imaging at maximum speed of 100 frames per second with 512 by 512 pixels. This is very important to obtain high-quality, real-time in vivo images from live animal by compensating the tissue motion. So this briefly shows the, uh, how animal motion compensation works in IBM Technologies microscope. So this is the real-time intravital microscopy movie. So as you can see, the tissue is constantly moved around. So to obtain high-quality images, we need to compensate this motion by frame by frame, like this showing, showing these schematics. In this side-by-side -side comparison, it is very clear that the high-quality in vivo imaging needs this motion compensation function. Without the motion compensations, only this broad imaging can be obtained due to the motion artifact of the uh, tissue in live animal model. 
So again, this real-time ultra-fast imaging is the heat and motion compensation is the key enabling technology for the real-time intravital imaging of the pulmonary microcirculation and immune response in sepsis animal model, which I'm going to start to uh, explain in the following slides. So to begin with, sepsis is a liposuretting organ dysfunction caused by dysregulated host response to the infections. And in sepsis patient, lung is the one of the major organ suffer this uh, major organ failure. But for the intravital imaging of the continuously moving lung inside the uh, live animal model, we need a stabilized lung imaging window chamber, which shows in this video. It has a small suction hole here, which it takes out, which can build up the negative pressure inside this imaging chamber. And then by doing that, it can stabilize the small part of the lung of the live animal model, as shown in this video. This shows the whole procedure for the stabilized intervital imaging of the lung. First, the mouse needs to be intubated, and then it's, con uh, it's connected to the ventilator to provide the uh, uh, oxygen, the breathing of the live animal model, and then exposing the lung like this, and then using the, this vacuum suction-based lung imaging window chamber. That by using this setting, we can obtain this very high quality intravital microscopic imaging of the lung. So in this particular example, the green shows the blood vessel, and red shows the neutrophil, and the blue shows the uh, blood circulation imaged by uh, fluorescence dextrans. This is the uh, real-time RBC tracking video obtained from the live anesthetized mouse. Uh, in this example, we use the type 2 GFP mouse model. In this mouse, all the endothelial cells express GFP, as like this. And then to image the red blood cell, uh, we take out the blood from the donor mouse and then label the red blood cell by using DID, the red profile. And then we adaptively transfer to the recipient mouse by intravenous injections and then, use, and then image this mouse long. And then this is the uh, real time data. And then to image the, to follow up the uh, uh, flowing red blood cell in the capillary, we first did the uh, motion compensation, as I, ex as I explained in the previous slides. So we basically compensate the motion of the lung in X and Y direction, frame by frame. And by doing that, we can greatly improve the SNR and then get this high quality capillary network inside the lung. And then we can operate the real-time video of the flowing red blood cell shown in the uh, previous slides, and this is the result. That by using the uh, tracking software, we can get this kind of uh, uh, red blood cell flowing uh, data analysis from the uh, from this video. And then now we compare this red blood cell flowing perfusion inside the uh, normal mouse, normal healthy mouse model and then LPS induced sepsis mouse model. So again, so you can see this red blood cell is flowing inside the capillary, but it's a little bit difficult to quantify. So what we did was we did the uh, time projection uh, imaging of the red flowing red blood cell. So basically for the 30 seconds with 900 image frames, we just operate all the dead blood cells captured in this uh, real-time video. And this is the result. So in upper panel, it shows the uh, normal healthy mouse. So as you can see, in this green capillary, almost all this green capillary is perfused by the red blood cell, like this. But in LPS-induced sepsis mouse model, we can see certain capillary branches like here, and, uh, marked by this star mark. So capillary, net, capillary branches is not perfused anymore by the red blood cell, uh, shown in red in here. And then we just we can quantify the functional capillary ratio by using these uh, equations. So in normal mouse, compared to the normal mouse, 
more than 50% of the capillary is perfused during 30 seconds, then LPS induces the sepsis mouse model. Its ratio is defined is below the half of the normal mouse. And then, then why? Why this red blood cell cannot flow in certain branch of the uh, sepsis animal model in the lung? And then, to see the impact of the neutrophil, we did this uh, imaging. So this is a time-lapse imaging obtained for 10 minutes. So in this particular example, we use anti lysex g antibody conjugated red blood cell. We intervention injected this conjugated antibody to label the, all of the intravascular neutrophil inside the uh, sepsis animal model. And then this, this video clearly shows that the neutrophil inside the lung of the uh, sepsis mouse model can form this cluster in the arterial like this here. And then once this cluster forms, then pulmonary microcirculation visualized by this hepatitis dextran is completely blocked like this. So again, we image the red blood cell together with the neutrophil and green blood flow. And this is the result. So this magenta colored neutrophil forms a cluster here and also here. And then in this area, we cannot see the red blood cell perfusion anymore like this. So we can clearly see this neutrophil cluster blocks the uh, red blood cell flows. And by doing that, it made the dead, it can form a dead space inside the lung. Uh, dead space means the area inside the lung, which is uh, uh, ventilated, so air is coming in, but the red blood cell does not come in that area, so thereby it cannot contribute to the oxygen exchange from there. So, uh, again, to really verify that this neutrophil is the key factor for this formation of the uh, dead space, the RBC, not uh, non-RBC non purpose area, we deflate the neutrophil by injecting the high dose, very high dose of lysex G antibody. And then at 24 hours later, uh, we did the same experiment. And then in this neutrophil depleted mouse, even with the, in this uh, neutrophil depleted mouse, the LPX induced sepsis does not cause the, uh, this dead space formation of non-RBC purpose area as shown in here. And then, uh, and then we try to analyze the, what uh, a surface molecule is unregulated in this entrapped neutrophil uh, forms, uh, forming a cluster. And then we find out the CD11B and CD18 is upregulated in this uh, neutrophil cluster, as shown in these images. And actually, this CD11B and CD18 uh, can form the MAG1. And then there is a, uh, one clinically approved drugs, Apsicima, which, which have a cross-specificity, cross-reactivity with MAC1. Uh, originally, this Apsicima was used to as a uh, blocker inhibitor for the glycoprotein 2B and 3A. Thereby, uh, it can help the, uh, it can, it can inhibit the formation of a microsombi. But it, anyway, it has cross-reactivity with MAC1 as well. So we tried to uh, test the efficacy of this Apsima in this sepsis animal model again. So in normal uh, scrambled antibody, it has no impact, basically. So it cannot block the uh, formation of this dead space inside the uh, lung of the sepsis mouse model, as you can see. And then it coincides with uh, this neutrophil cluster as well. Uh, but the, but if we block the uh, CD11B by using anti cd 11 antibody, we can restore this uh, RBC perfusion as like shown in here. And then, of course, this Apsima also has a similar effect as shown in here. So as you can see here, uh, without the, uh, with, uh, with the scrambled antibody, the Lysis G antibody greatly increased and formed a cluster and then thereby blocked the red blood cell perfusion. But both of the anti cd 11 b antibody and this Apsima can greatly reduce the number of lysis G antibody inside the lung, and thereby 
it can restore the functional capillary ratio like this. So finally, we try to image the pre, before uh, abscissimal injection and after abscissimal treatment. So this is basically the same site, but with half hour difference in time frame. So before the injection of the abscissima, as you can see, this, uh, like this neutral field cluster uh, is the cause, is the major cause of this uh, dead space in here. So you cannot see the, this red color, red blood cell perfusion in this area. But the only half hour after this abscissima uh, treatment, we can, block, we can see the very small portion of the neutral field cluster is actually uh, relieved. And by doing that, it, now we can see the perfusion of the red blood cell is recovered in this area, in this area of the uh, dead space. So pre and after the abscissimal treatment, the functional capillary ratio is increased, and also arterial oat pressure is also recovered as shown in here. So, so to conclude, this abscissima, uh, the neutrophil, the MAG1 unregulated neutrophil cluster is the one of the major cause, and this is the major cause of the uh, reduced auto pressure uh, in the lung of the uh, in the uh, sepsis mouse model. Uh, and this is the uh, your uh, the time lapse video showing before and after this abscissima treatment. So as you can see, this red colored red blood cell perfusion is recovered after this abscissima treatment. So this work was reported in uh, European Respiratory Journal in 2019. And then this work is the very good example of utilizing the intravital imaging technology to see the uh, code, cellular level mechanism of the certain disease. In this case, it was sepsis. So uh, this kind of uh, uh, Intravital imaging based research can be done in many other organs, as you can expect. Uh, now, before finishing my talk, I'd like to introduce the newly launched two photon microscopy model, IBM MS2. IBM MS2 is the most compact and affordable intravital two photon microscopy system in the market. It has a key features such as cost and space saving easy installation, high usability, and hands-free maintenance in all-in-one packages. It's fully integrated with a compact femtosecond first laser module for two-photon imaging and four detectors for multicolor imaging, which enables high-quality in vivo imaging of various tissues, as shown here. As a two-photon microscopic system, it has a very small footprint of 500 mm by 620 mm on the table. IBIN technology also provides one-stop total solution of intravital imaging service for pharmaceutical R&D, starting from the customer consulting to achieve the research goal by in vivo live cell imaging. IBIN performs test imaging to optimize the imaging plan and provide quotations. Then, I've been performed full intravital imaging research, creating animal model, imaging of the various organs, and finally, image processing analysis and provide the report. If you have an interest in our intravital max technology, please ask for the full product and service catalog by email, or just visit our website for more information. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Kim and Dr. Jung for the great discussion today. We'll now move on to the live Q&A section where Dr. Kim and Tanya will answer your questions. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Gabrielle, for um, passing things off to me and for Dr. Jin and Dr. Kim for their presentations um, today. I do want to let everyone know they can enter any questions that they have that have come up throughout the presentation in the Q&A dialog box at the bottom of your screen. And I'll start working through those with Dr. Kim now, but I'm happy to have any other questions um, that you've come up with. 
Dr. Kim, one of the first uh, questions that came through, and you may have mentioned it, but can you um, just again reiterate what the light source is that's being used in the system and maybe a little bit more details about available wavelengths for the different models? Uh, okay, sure. Uh, so the light sources are all laser. And then for, comp for comparable implementation, we normally use uh, four lasers with, uh, with wavelengths at 405, 488, 561, and 640. And then if needed, we can uh, change the wavelengths. And then for two photon light source, uh, we use, it can use two laser system. One is the tunable femtosecond laser system. Uh, it normally, it normally be able to be tuned from 780 nanometer to uh, 1060 nanometer, uh, no, 1030 nanometer. And then the other option is fixed wavelengths femtosecond laser module at the wavelengths of uh, 920 nanometer. Perfect. Thanks so much for taking the time to answer that. Uh, another question relates back to one of the studies that you were showing using Dextran and taking a look at the signal over time. It appeared that that signal um, decreased over time. And we're just wondering if there's a reason for that or if it's just as an effect of decrease of circulation of the, de of the Dextran. Uh Okay, so the answer is it's just the impact of decrease in the circulation. Got it. So, yeah. Perfect. Um, another question, what is the maximum imaging depth? And perhaps this is different for each of the different mm -hmm. models available. Uh, yeah, that's true. So I showed you that uh, we can, we have imaged the uh, various different organ and tissue in vivo. And then the image maximum imaging depths uh, differs a lot depending on the tissue and organs. So brain is the deep, uh, the, for example, the brain is the deep, uh, the organ we can image uh, most deeply. And then with the comparable microscope, the imaging depth is typically uh, from 100 micrometer to 100, uh, 100 micrometer to 200 micrometer. It also depends on the wavelengths as well. And then with the two photon microscope, their maximum imaging depth is uh, around 500 micrometer to 700 micrometer uh, in the brain. But in the skin, the imaging depth is much less actually. So for example, so in the skin, for example, uh, the comparable imaging depth is normally less than 100 micrometer and two photon imaging depth is 250 to 300 micrometer. Uh, and then I realized that there, there are one another question about the, uh, whether we have performed any vascular morphogenic analysis, like branching, diameter, and distributions. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we did, actually. Uh, and for this kind of, so uh, we did this type of analysis in tumor model to analyze the uh, tumor in geogenesis. Uh, and for this analysis, we normally use a freeware tool, which is called NGO tool. It's freely available on, the, uh, on their website. Perfect. Um, another question, are there second harmonic imaging capabilities of the system? And again, just to look at collagen fibers. Uh, yeah, of course. So with the two photo microscope, with the two, with the two photo microscope model, we can, we can readily do the, the second harmonic generation imaging to look at the collagen fibers. And then also, you know, like a uh, sarcomere in myocyte, and uh, in some cases, some microtubule as well. Perfect, great. Um, there were a few questions that came from Dr. Jung's work. I know we lost connection with him. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, are you familiar with his work enough to ask those questions or shall we just follow up with him directly? Uh, yeah, it may be better to ask follow Dr. directly. Sure. Perfect, yeah, excellent. We will answer this question later. Perfect, I, I presumed I just wanted to ask and check. Um, I don't see any other questions, but if anyone else joining the presentation today has questions, please feel free to use that Q&A dialogue box again. If you're having any trouble with that, feel free to use the chat window. I am uh, taking a look at both. 
we'll give people just a few more minutes. Um, uh, did you ever have an issue with vascular leakiness affecting your image quality, Dr. Kim? Oh, uh, yeah, sometimes. It, sometimes it happens. But the, with the high molecular weight dextran, we normally don't have this kind of problem. Great. But the, sometimes, it, some, but the, in some cases, if the, uh, if the surgical procedure was too, inv too invasive, then we may you know, suffer this kind of problem due to the bleeding. Right. And you had mentioned in one of your last slides, and I know we've mm -hmm. talked about it extensively, both the team at IVIMTech as well as the team at Syntica have extensive experience with doing those surgeries. So if you're new to intravital microscopy and you're not too sure how to implement those surgeries, um, there's a tremendous amount of resources available to help you. Um, and as well with the system, there's there's a number of different imaging chambers and windows that are available that have been optimized that um, you can choose from. And again, the team at IVIMTech and Syntica are quite familiar. Uh, Dr. Kim, maybe you wanted to just go through the different available windows so that people have a sense of the areas that you have expertise in as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, and I, I see, I saw, I'm looking at the, another question from the mm -hmm. timer. So mm -hmm. how many times I can image the same same animal over time? Mm -hmm. So, well, it also depends, actually, depending on the uh, invasiveness of the uh, surgical procedure for the intravital imaging. But the, uh, uh, so for when we use the uh, imaging window technique, such as dorsal skimpole chamber or a chronic cranial imaging window or abdominal imaging window, the, uh, the time, uh, the imaging times, can, you know, well, theoretically, there is no limit mm -hmm. in terms of uh, the, how many times we can image the same. If we use the window model, so so to give you an idea, so with the cranial uh, the chronic cranial imaging window, we have kept the mouse for more than six months, and then we image the same mice like uh, every week. Wow. Mm -hmm. So it's more than you know, more than ten or fifteen times. Mm -hmm. And then also in the in some of our some of my in some of my work, I have imaged the bone marrow for more than ten times also in the mm -hmm. same animal to look at the uh, bone marrow cell uh, uh, proliferations. So it, all, so it all depends on the uh, you know, invasiveness and then the, your kind of uh, way to manage the uh, animal mm -hmm. model after each image. Right. So the, the, the another you know, practical thing is we have to you know, keep the mouse to be warm during the imaging. Mm -hmm. Uh, to help them to uh, to have the mouse to recover uh, well, recover better uh, from the anesthesia. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And the available windows on the IVIM systems include, mm -hmm. you showed the heart and lung one. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, you have mentioned the, the chronic cranial window. No, yeah. Um, and dorsal skin point chamber. Yes. And then abdominal, abdominal window. imaging window. window. Perfect. For their abdominal organs, such as spleen, pancreas, kidney, liver, and so on. Great. And if people have experience with intravital and they've developed their own window chambers that they're mm -hmm. comfortable with, can the IVM mm -hmm. systems be modified to work with them? Oh, yeah, sure, of course. So uh, if, we, if, the custom, if the user already have their own window design, mm -hmm. we can provide the you know, customized uh, kind of folder Right. Order to you know keep the uh, window at the proper plane during the imaging. Perfect. Excellent. On the objective lens. Great. I know as Dr. Kim and I have gone back and forth with questions that have come from customers, mm -hmm. it, it sounds like the answer is always yes, we can work with the customer, which is really nice <laughs> yeah, to sure. see. Yeah. Um, there's lots of options and flexibility yeah. that we can um, work with everyone. We are approaching the top of the hour, so I do want to thank Dr. Jung. I know we lost mm -hmm. connection and Dr. Kim mm -hmm. for their time today, and I'll pass things back to Gabrielle for um, a few final statements. Thank you, Tanya, and thank you, Dr. Kim. So we have reached the 60 minute mark for our session today, and to be respectful of everyone's time, we're going to wrap things up. As mentioned at the start of our webinar, 
but we'll be sure to answer any questions in the written transcript and we'll work to get this out to you over the next week or so. I would like to thank again, Dr. Kim, Dr. Jung and Tanya for the wonderful presentation today. I trust that we have been able to provide you with some relevant information about the imaging examples using the IVM intravital microscope. As I mentioned at the beginning of today's webinar, this is, for, this is a third of what will be a four part series. Please keep an eye out for the emails in the following weeks for the next portion of the series or visit our website to view the previous recorded session. If in the days and weeks to come, you have further questions about the modalities discussed today, I encourage you to reach out to us here at Syndica and we'll happy, be happy to discuss further. We'll welcome the opportunity to discuss your specific research goals and how any of our imaging systems could help move your work forward. Thanks again to all of you for taking time out of your day to attend our session. We look forward to seeing you at a future Syndica event. Have a wonderful day.